Hi everyone, welcome back to the Trailline Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Moglin, and joining me today is Larry Williams, renowned trader and veteran of over 60 years in the business, and also the winner of the World Cup Championship of Futures Trading with a return of over 11,000% back in 1987. Uh, Larry, it's a real pleasure to have you on. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure of mine. I'm looking forward to this. Perfect. And to start things off, I love hearing about uh, how people got interested in the markets in the first place, how they got started in the business, and also early mistakes you made. So yeah, could you tell kind of people your, your story and yeah, how, how you developed your style to this day? Well, er, early mistakes, I'm still making them. So I don't know where we start. Uh, it started for me in 1962. I was in college at the University of Oregon. I have my degree in journalism. I have no idea about economics. I took an economic class and walked out after one day. It made no sense to me. Um, but uh, there was a newspaper headline about the crash in 1962 because President Kennedy rolled back steel prices. And I asked him, well, what does this mean? Because I don't come from a family that ever owned stocks. My dad worked in an oil refinery as I did in the summers. And they said, well, this stock went up one point today. That means if you would have bought it yesterday, you would have made $100. $100 in a day? Hello, this is for me. How do I get into this? It looked like really easy work. Just guess what stock will go up. That should be pretty easy to do. Well, I found out it isn't. So it really compelled me to get into this with greed, nothing else mm-hmm. than that. And it looked like easy money um, and, uh, and a challenge, a really detective challenge. And so that's what it began was a crash in 1962. And Along the way, when you're first getting started, what kind of resources did you turn to, books, other traders that you looked up to? How did you actually learn about the business? Well, back then, it was totally different. Than it is now. There was no internet. Yeah. The Wall Street Journal came about three days late, usually four days late after it was published in New York City because I was living in Monterey, Carmel, California. So I was, everything was way delayed, which means I think the markets move slower then than they do now. Now they're, boom, 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 they're, all, they're like boom, 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 boom. So the tempo is sped up as uh, the flow of news has increased. It's uh, much more rapid now. But the learning process, it was e- easy then in that there are only a handful of books, like maybe 30 books to read. You know, I went to the library in Los Angeles and San Francisco, every place I could try to get stuff. There wasn't very much stuff to learn. My first book I really sunk my teeth into was Joe Granville's book, uh, who later became a friend of mine. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that was an interesting transition. But the first guy who really made a difference in my life was Gil Holler who wrote a little red book on called The Holler Theory. And Gil was such a kind man. He kind of took me in under his wing. And uh, I went to State Line, Nevada, where he was, and went for a couple of hikes with him in the woods. And he just explained his theory of the markets to me. He was a very unique guy. He lived in a little two-bedroom apartment. His desk was a couple of cinder blocks with a, a, a door propped up across a cinder box. It was like just a, a, a hermit in his lifestyle but just fascinated with the markets. And he gave me some insight, but more than anything, I think Gil gave me encouragement. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And was he a, a technical focused trader or was he a little mixture of fundamentals as well as technicals? Gil was totally technical. He'd been a, a, a ship captain, a mm-hmm. uh, very interesting guy. And uh, he was really the first guy, I think, who did any serious work with relative strength. Yeah. Uh, even before Robert Levy, Gil Holler had written his Holler Theory, and he was really looking at relative strength. But he also did a lot of technical work, the advanced decline line, new highs, new lows, that later on Norm Fosbach, Stock Market Logic, picked up on and kind of updated Gil's work. So Gil was a revolutionary for his time. And just such a great guy. So so incredibly kind and very precise. We were out for a hike one day, and he was ahead of me, and he pointed down to the trail and said, barbed wire three strands he's like just like don't watch out for the wire here it's like specifically three strands yeah yeah and yeah t- tell me a little bit about relative strength and kind of what that means to you because i, I think that's a really important concept that uh is kind of a nuance that many traders learn down the road but many people starting out might not so i'd love to hear kind of what relative strength means to you and, and how you apply it in your trading well relative strength is looking at, at 
which stock, stock or commodity has been the strongest over X time period. Yeah. So if I look at, say, uh, 10 stocks starting a year ago, which one has the largest percentage gain between now and one year ago? Uh, there's a problem with that. I'll get into that in a moment. The opportunity is, well, what's the best time frame? Six months, a year, two years. So the relative strength guys more or less have settled on about one year, uh, the best time period. Whatever stocks have been the strongest for the last year, in theory, will most likely be the strongest stocks for at least the next six months. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly a lot of momentum players play the market that way. But more importantly, as a short-term trader, I have come to think that comparative strength is much more important than relative strength. So comparative strength, I'm going to compare, like tonight I was looking at corn versus soybeans. And uh, uh, which of those has been the strongest? They're in the same family. They're, they're both grains. So which one I'm looking for bicycle, which one has held up the best here, which one has rallied the most and declined the least in declines compared to the other grains, then that market will be the one that I want to buy. Look at the current uh, energies right now as well. Uh, mm -hmm. There's been a real difference in the heating oil and crude oil. So if I want to sell short, uh, heating oil is a little weaker today. So I, I'm looking at a comparative strength a lot more than a relative strength. Super interesting. And and yeah, I, I'd love to go through some charts later on uh, in this interview and, and kind of see how you apply that in, in day to day. Uh, but first, I'd love to just ask you kind of what markets you you kind of uh, were trading at the beginning of your career and also what you're currently interested in today. And uh, I'd be interested to hear if you're doing any crypto or anything related to that. So uh, yeah, uh, what, what kind of markets do you, do you really like to focus on? When I started trading, my big market well, pork bellies, we don't trade anymore. Potatoes, mm -hmm. that we don't trade anymore. Um, the big market then was soybeans for a commodity trader. That's still around, but it's not actively traded. So there was a real transition. Eggs were also a great market, a wonderful seasonal trade. Eggs mm -hmm. almost will always rally before Easter. <laughs> like he, he just, that was the money of the bank trade, but we don't trade eggs anymore. Don't trade potatoes, yeah. don't trade pork bellies. So all that stuff changed. Because in the old days, we just had what I call natural or God-given commodity markets. Uh, the grains, uh, some metals, uh, wheat, real things, fungible items, tangible right. items. And then we added uh, treasury bonds, currency, stock index, futures, all these man-made things versus mm -hmm. natural things. So that was a big shift. That began, started beginning about 1973, 74. Uh, and so now the markets I focus on the most would be a gold, treasury mm -hmm. bonds, stock index futures, energies. Reason why? That's where the volume is. That's where I can get in and out uh, with a lot easier. And I'm, like right now, I see some signals in the soft. Like, uh, you know, I can't trade 50 contracts there. Maybe I can, but I'm afraid to. Mm -hmm. um, because I suddenly become the market. So I'm really in the big, broad volume markets. So liquidity is super important for you at, at this stage. Liquidity is important just from a mental point, because if I have yeah. a stop at the market, like, oh, there's no trades there, then I'll, I'll move my stop or do things I shouldn't do. Whereas a big, broad market, I mean, if it moves, <laughs> it's a real move. It isn't them going to get me? So right. I, I like the broad markets uh, from a psychological viewpoint, plus uh, I can click them out. It's just so easy now versus the old days. Much easier to trade now. Yeah, it makes sense. And go, going back to your early days of trading, what were some really specific learning moments and kind of turning points in your in your experience and also your performance? How did, how did you go from just starting to learn how, uh, learn how to trade to getting 11,000% that year in 1987? Well, the couple learning experiences. Uh, one, there were three of us that were tutored by a guy by the name of Bill Meehan. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill uh, did myself, Chet Conrad, and uh, the Campbell brothers, and that one, the Campbell funds in Baltimore. And Bill really taught all of us separately. Uh, I paid Bill a lot of money to come to Carmel Valley and teach me what he knew. He had been a former member of the Board of Trade. And Bill was a very long term fundamentalist. And mm -hmm. I had just been a technician. The reason we got together, people said, Larry, you got great timing, but you don't have a clue where the market's going. Bill's got, he knows where the markets are going, but he doesn't know when. So you guys got to get together. And we did. And that was a, just a huge, oh my gosh, what a, what a valuable thing. Bill was a very unique guy as well. 
uh, to learn from him a lot of things beyond just the markets, but he taught me about the commitment to trade reports, premiums in the market, squeeze plays in the market. Uh, and uh, Bill was very instrumental in giving me a fundamental concept to apply with a technical concept. The breakthrough sure. though, that came from very short-term trading these spectacular gains that people saw was I had the idea it's now very popular of volatility breakouts uh, mm -hmm. about 1982 maybe 83 i came up with the idea that what was really important is how markets move from the opening price uh, way back in the 70s i did a major accumulation kind of like granville's on balance volume but i looked at the volume change from the opening of the day to the close of the day i, I always think you open an important figure so then i noticed that and this is still true today. Marcus, a big range update, it closes on its high. So they have a big day, blasts off. They mm -hmm. almost always open on their low. Mm -hmm. A big down range day almost always opens on the high. So my theory is if we have an opening price, we just bracket that a little bit above and below the opening. And whichever way it goes, if we have a big range day, we're going to catch a big move. So that volatility breakout was a, a huge um, I did a, a, a paid uh, system that I taught some people and a lot of people, a lot, it's really interesting, made over a million dollars trading it uh, as I did. The bad news, the electronic markets came around where you don't have opening ranges anymore. They're not important because in the old days, we would close tonight and open eight hours later in the morning. We'd have these big gaps. And, and now we close in a couple hours later, boom, we open again. So we're not getting the gaps that we once had. So that trading strategy was, was brilliant back then. It, it's really not nearly as practical now, unfortunately, as it was then. For sure. And um, tell me a little bit, because because kind of similar to that is your oops reversal setup, right? Um, yeah, so, that was yeah, the same yeah. thing. Was, yeah. If a market opens below a prior day's low and comes back to it, yeah. that was a real money maker. Hardly ever happens anymore. It happens on Sunday night session. That's pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. I bought a couple of lows in the S&Ps. Uh, uh, March uh, 2020 low, I think, was an oops trade for the market on on Monday or Sunday night because of all the pessimism. Like, well, way down, oh, the end of the world. Uh, and that comes around and comes back to last night's low and takes off to the upside. It, it still is there a little bit, but again, because of the doggone absence of the pit sessions, that's not what it once was. But look for it on Sunday nights. For sure. Yeah, I, I, I've yeah, I, I've used it actually pretty effectively in growth stocks, um, especially when we get a gap down the overall market. A lot of the leaders showing relative strength really just push through that low very quickly. And often that's, that starts, I'm kind of a swing trader a few days to weeks, and it often starts a really nice momentum burst. Uh, starting with the oops reversal it, it does have application in individual stocks i hardly ever trade stocks anyway it's yeah. not boring that's for old people to do i trade commodities that's for young guys to do <laughs> and um uh and we, so we have these instant uh closes and openings but yeah. you stock guys are lucky you still have those overnight gaps so it right. does have application to the stock market clearly and, okay. and even to how do i say that word you said it earlier crypto what do you call that stuff Cryptocurrency. Yeah, yeah, crypto. yeah, I've heard that. I've heard about that. I, I also noticed that it, there's a lot of oops, really good oops buy and sell signals and whatever that hypto crypto stuff is. <laughs> yeah, uh, for sure. And outside, outside of the people you've already mentioned, were there any super influential traders that maybe you looked up to, had lunch with, or just kind of studied their books? I'd love oh, to hear sure. about that. Tom, Tom Mark. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom and I have been dear friends, oh, I don't know, 50 years, you know. We've gone to each other's families, kids' weddings, and uh, you know, yeah, Tom was uh, very, very technical mm -hmm. and taught me a lot about how to look at charts. I think I have a pretty good eye to look for things, but Tom always saw things weren't there. We developed a couple strategies together, one called sequential. Tom and I developed that, really interesting, still mm -hmm. works. He was in Racine, Wisconsin. I was living in Kalispell, Montana. No computers. We developed it all over the telephone, two guys here at night calling each other up. Um, so uh, Tom, I would always have to give great credit because Tom, I learned so much uh, about the little minutia of the market. Tom's the very best ever on that. For sure. Other traders, um, 
Yeah, Charlie DeFrancesco was the largest bond trader in the history of the world, taught me an important lesson one night. Um, so other, you know, it's like bits and pieces, you pick things up. I've been around Steve Cohen a little bit. Uh, I mm -hmm. think I picked up some wonderful lessons from Steve. Uh, he's not a mechanical trader. I used to think, oh, we just have a mechanical system. I got real clear. Steve's house one night, we're having dinner. And on the, the wall is a Rembrandt or Van Gogh, I forget which. That was my art books when I was an art major my first year in college. I go, oh, he owns it. <laughs> it was in my books. And, and he's not a mechanical trading. And at that point, I threw away most of my mechanical systems. And so, you know, it's probably more money in the art of trading because that's what Steve does. He, I don't think he falls in a mechanical system. He has a phenomenal sense for the market, despite what you've heard. This guy really has a sense of the market. That was a big wake up call for me as well. Like, you know what? Mechanical systems do make money. Uh, I've got several that we've been trading for four or five years in a brokerage firm. They've made money consistently. Um, but uh, big money, uh, no, they do really well, better than most funds do. But if you want to really knock the ball out of the park, it takes more work. For sure. And and what were some of the insights that Steve kind of passed on to you or, or that you learned from Steve? The, the, the big one was just, he's not a mechanical trader. That was just a gotcha. huge lesson. Oh, yeah, you know what? What can I learn from this? He's not a mechanical trader. Gotcha, gotcha. And outside of, of traders that, that you learned from and knew personally, were there any specific books that you think are, are really good at explaining explaining the nuances of trading that would be good for new traders? Um, oh, yeah, and, all, of my, yeah. all of my books. My books are great. My books are the type of books that once you put them down, you can't pick them back up. So maybe my books, I don't know. Uh, Tom DeMarc's books are good. They're very detailed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Granville book still has some value to it, though so many things have changed. I think, though, the best learning experience is, first of all, you can buy almost all these books cheaper on Amazon, on, on Amazon or eBay mm -hmm. um, uh, than you can directly on Amazon. Um, that the best lesson really is just looking at the market. Um, my belief is that the market's trying to teach me something every day. Mm -hmm. And when I see that my trades are not working here, not working there, hello, Larry, what is the market trying to teach you? The market's the best teacher. So if, if you look at your trades and say what went wrong here, the market will tell you what went wrong if you just look at it. So yeah, there's a, so a lot of great books out there. Uh, Jake Bernstein's, Tom DeMarks, uh, John Bollinger, I mean, and on and on. Linda Bradford Ratchie, oh my gosh, she's written an interesting book. A lot of good books, but ultimately, the market is your teacher. If you just let it teach you, if you want to say, what, tell me what I did wrong here. Learn. It will teach you what you're doing wrong. For sure. So it's, it's all about listening to that feedback, listening to. Yeah. And, yeah. and not getting too much stuff. I look at people's uh, uh, computers now in the old day with charts. They go, what do you think? I have 35 indicators on here. Mm -hmm. And they have my percent R, Bollinger percent B, uh, stochastics, uh, MAC. They're all the same thing. Mm -hmm. There's not an ounce of spit of difference between these indicators. So the, the secret with indicators is this. A, the indicator must have the time frame of the commodity you're trading. So most indicators use a 10-day or a 14-day look back period. And they're, well, pork bellies aren't in our pork bellies. Hogs are not in a 14-day time period. Uh, neither are the S&Ps or crude oil. You better adapt it to the time frame of the market you're trading. A, B, each indicator in your chart should serve a different purpose. Right. So to have an oscillator on and another, they're all the same thing. They're all bottomless oscillator. Like, so what? You just need one of those. I think you need one to measure accumulation, one to measure or bottom or sold, one to measure momentum or trend, uh, one to help you understand the patterns of the market. So each tool should help you in a separate, different fashion. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's just all redundant. It's all 35 indicators, but you're going to have one on there. And it, it's almost like noise overload, and you, can act, you can't actually see what the price action is, is actually doing. Yeah, we get way too much noise overloaded, especially by the time you're watching television, talking heads, and emails, and all this. Like, why well, I hate to pull back, make it simpler. For sure. And I'd love to, to ask you, Larry, about uh, the biggest loss you've ever taken and then kind of what you learned from it. And th this can be a dollar amount, percentage amount. Uh, I'm sure there's sure. some really interesting stories here. 
Yeah, well, uh, it was about a million dollars in a couple of months. Uh, and it goes back to my friend Bill um, Meehan, who was the guy who really taught me so much. Bill thought cattle would go up. And I really believe in Bill, so I bought a lot of cattle. And then went down and said, well, hey, I even better deal now. So I bought more cattle. And then went down again, and I bought more cattle. <laughs> And finally, they have more money to buy cattle with, and they continue going lower. Uh, and it was a time when I'd made a lot of money in the market. Uh, so, I mean, it was, it was very painful, obviously, it was a big equity drawdown for me. Uh, but the lesson from that was, A, don't ever trust anybody totally. Mm -hmm. And B, the lesson Bill always taught me and that I try to teach people now. This is, this is the whole secret to making money in the market. There's two, two phases of it. One is trend is the only way you're going to make money in the market. If there's no trend, you're not going to make money. It doesn't matter if it's stocks or real estate or whatever it is. Okay, so let's analyze trend. This is what I thought about. That well, okay, what's the function of trend? And clearly the function of trend, there's just one thing, time. So the more time you can have in a, in a move, in a position, the bigger the trend may be. It may not happen or not, but you have more potential for trend if you can give the trade more time. So that's huge because the other point Bill always made to me is that the way you make money in this market is to have small positions, never bet big. So if you have a small position and you catch a big trend move, you can make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But if you have a big position and try to catch a little trend move, well, by the time you're stopped out, you probably lose more. So it doesn't work. So to me, the ultimate money management secret, there's a lot of formulas out there. Ralph Vince has written some great books on it. But the ultimate one is bet small and catch large moves. And, and that's a money making a way to trade stocks or commodities. Never put all your chips down in any one trade, which is what I did in cattle. And that's why I lost. I should have. Mm -hmm. And what's kind of, uh, and it obviously might be different now, um, but what, what's kind of your position sizing guidelines? How much of your portfolio would you put in into any one idea? Well, I'm an old man and you know, I'm looking at 80 years now. So I only yeah. risk about 40% of my money in every trade. No, <laughs> that's a little high. Um, my average risk is higher than most people's because I've been doing this and I think I will survive. Uh, so I'm probably risking between five and 10% on a trade. 10% would be very high, uh, but I've done it. Uh, but usually I'm coming around 5%. And I think for most people, 4% should be maximum risk. 2%, mm -hmm. that's what the funds do. That's why their performance is, yeah, middle of the road. They're not really fit to making some money sometimes, but it's not spectacular. If you, the larger your risk, the more spectacular results will be up or down. Mm -hmm. If you want to have maximum performance, you have to have maximum risk. And that means you could have maximum exposure. So you have to think about that. So, and to me, the, the thing about money management is this, it's not really money management. It's emotional management. I, I can stand, withstand losing 20, 30% of my entire balance on one trade. I've done that. I can live through that. A lot of people can't do that. They get way emotional. So at what point does your bet size make you too emotional to trade? Right. That's the most important part. It's not money management is money management, but it's also emotional management. The people who get emotional, it isn't because of the markets, it's because their commitment to the market is too large. So if you're going, oh, what's going on here? You're yelling at your kids and kicking the dog and not talking to your wife and stuff. It's not the markets, it's your bet size. Right. And just to clarify, risking four or five percent on any given trade is that the amount that you're willing to to completely let up, or is that your position size? That's what I'll lose. Let's say I'm managing a million dollar account. I'm going to lose forty thousand dollars in the trade if I'm wrong. Gotcha. A lot of money. That's real yeah. money. I mean, you know, when I I started, I didn't have any money like that. I, I bought a battery for my car yesterday, $239. My first car cost less than $100. So all these numbers like, and I've had days where you lose a lot of money, but you can't think of the dollar amount. You can only think of the percentage amount because I know, I know people who don't make that much money in a year that I'll lose in a trade. And I have empathy with them and I grew up that way. So sometimes it still gets me like, geez, that's a lot of money. 
Yeah. Uh, but I try to think not just a percentage of the bankroll. That's all that it is. Right. Right. And going back to the cattle trade example, um, another thing that stood out to me is you're kind of averaging down on your position. Um, oh yeah, don't never yeah. do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> never, ever, ever. That's one thing I learned. Yeah. If you're wrong, you're wrong. As soon as you get out of a bad deal, whether it's stock market, a partnership, a relationship, whatever it is, the better it is. So it's the same thing. You don't average down, and I don't really average up very much either. That occasionally I had to trade, not often. Mm -hmm. But the the sooner you're out of a bad deal, the better it is, whether it's a stock market, commodity market, or a relationship, or a business deal. A business I like that. Partnership. If it's a bad deal, hostile away, man. Get out of there. For sure. And and what other are what are some other keys to risk management that you think you've learned over over your career um, that you think are important to pass on to people? Well, when I first started trading, I had a large up and down swing because I had no nobody had written about money man. We really didn't know yeah. what it was. Uh, there was there was no literature on it, so we were just cowboys. I mean, we bet uh, quite often everything on a trade, or almost everything on two or three trades. So it was great big swing to the upside and way to the downside. A lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> like, wow. <Yeah. laughs> like when I used to ride bareback on rodeos, it was the same thing. Like, well, way up in here, I get bucked off the horse. It hurts. Um, so finally, I, I realized I had to tame this. And I thought it was emotional. But because of work by Ralph Vince and some others, I realized that you really need to risk a percentage of your portfolio. And, and, then I have I used to have margin calls all the time. It was like when I was a kid, it was like, okay, I got none of those. Um, I haven't had a margin call I don't know, forty years. Yeah. Where it used to be like it was a daily occurrence <laughs> back in the old days. A lot of fun back then, but finally got well, why is this happening? And uh, alert, I'm betting too much, too big. Right. So so some keys there are keep your position size sizes in check here and make sure you're, you know, going in how much you're willing to risk on any given trade. Yeah. You stops because uh, yeah. all of us will go, oh, well, we'll go there. you better have your stop in, especially now because I place orders. It's uh, 530 my time now. I'll place orders and then I'll go, you know, walk away, have dinner and go to sleep tonight. I don't know what's going to happen tonight, but I better have a stop there uh, because the market could crash. Who knows what I'll do. So I always have my stops in the marketplace. And for, for your stop losses, do you set them based on a technical area, or is it always a basically a percentage loss from from your buy point? If you don't know yes, like <laughs> yes, yeah. both. Both. Um, I'll find a chart point where I say if it goes there, I got to get out of this trade. So let's say I'm buying at fifty, and my stop point is thirty. <clears throat> so whatever mm -hmm. that dollar amount is, let's say it's ten thousand dollars. And let's say I have a hundred thousand dollar account, and I'll take a four percent risk. Well, I can't if on ten thousand dollars I can't take the trade because it exceeds my four percent risk factor. Right. So my if let's say that I'm a hundred thousand dollar account, and my stop is five thousand dollars a week per contract of commodities we're talking about now. So I go okay, I can trade two contracts because that would be a ten thousand dollar risk if I'm using a ten percent risk number. If that stop is $2,000 away, it's close to the market. I can have five contracts. Mm -hmm. So that risk amount tells me how many contracts I can have. And the other point I've, I've uh, failed to mention earlier, the whole thing about money man, well, the two things about money man, big takeaways, of course, is going to protect yourself, but to extrapolate your gains, which is what I did when I won the trading championships and virtually all my students who continue to win these trading championships what they do is money management. As they make more money, they increase their commitment to the market. Mm -hmm. And that's why they get some incredible gains. They didn't stay at a one lot position or one contract or 100 shares, whatever. As you make more money, look at Warren Buffett. He's added to his portfolio. We've got to do the same thing. You have to compound. You have to. Absolutely. Yeah. You've, you've got to got to increase that bankroll. Occasionally, you want to take some money out, OK? Or your yeah. wife wants you to take some money out. but. Um, yeah, and you can do that, but you want that to exponentially increase. For sure. And uh, I want to I want to hear about the story behind your outstanding year in 1987, uh, where you did 11,000 over 11,000 percent. I think you turned 10,000 into over 
one million. Am I? Are those figures correct? Um, but I love to hear the story or about that. How you were trading differently there, then, and yeah, your your overall experience with that competition. Sure, that was 1987, and and many people say that was, including me, that was the worst year of my life. I don't want to ever do that again. Yeah, yeah at the end of the year, the ten thousand dollars, one point one million dollars, real time, real trading. Okay, why don't I want to do that again? Because at one point, the account was over $2 million. The $10,000 had yeah. gone to $2.2 million. And we had the crash of 1987, and I, I had an equity dip from $2.2 million to $750,000 when I was on a safari in Africa. Wow. I woke up in the morning at the uh, Mount Kenya Safari Club. And it's like smoke going around the room. This rumor, the Dow Jones crashed. It's down 200 points. No, I heard it's 300 points. It's down 600 points. All the young executives were there. They got in their planes and left. And I go, well, I got stops in. <clears throat> and uh, I had very large positions, the bond market. And uh, gapped up. I was short. It gapped up. And I got hurt real bad. I came back and traded at 750000 by the end of October then to $1.1 million at the end of December. Um, but the, the takeaway is, yeah, what, why that happened, why the results were so spectacular, is I risked about 30% of my equity on every single trade. Wow. So I had to be really correct, and I'm very focused, and I probably wasn't a very nice person that year. I didn't care about anything about yeah. except the markets. I was just like, that's all that mattered to me. And th there are better ways of living than that, I assure you. I found them. There are. Um, but if you want that type of performance, take tremendous focus, tremendous discipline, and being fortunate, lucky, whatever uh, on the markets. Uh, I don't think it'll ever anybody will ever touch that again. My daughter came close, and uh, ten years later, 1987, right. she turned ten thousand dollars to uh, hundred ten thousand um, dollars. So I think that's that's kind of the upper limits of reality. She yeah. risked ten percent on every trade. And uh, yeah, did, were you involved with uh, your daughter's, uh, d did you basically mentor your daughter and teach her your bas basic methods or did she kind of go out on her own and, and find her own love for the markets? No, she has no love for the market. I was, uh, I, I homeschooled uh, this daughter and uh, part of the homeschool thing was, well, you know, you need how to fix a car and maybe learn how to trade the markets. And so we started doing a little bit and she was trading, doing okay. Mm -hmm. But she was in a television show called Dawson's Creek, it was filmed in Wilmington, North Carolina. And her wake up call might be four in the morning, it was crazy hours. So I said, Look, Michelle, just tell the broker, Gene, to follow the system an automatic bond trading strategy <clears throat> that we had subscribers to. And, and you tell them to trade one contract for every $10,000. And she did. And she just followed the strategy. That's all she did. And, and uh, the results speak for itself. Interestingly enough, other people follow the same strategy and lost money huh. because they would choose one trade. So oh, this could be a good trade. And they'd bet five contracts and it would be a loser. Then the next trade would be a really good one. They bet one contract because the last trade, last trade was a loser. Right. So they weren't consistent in the money manager. So she had a really, really strong strategy that held up real well that year. And she advanced her equity commitment as she made more money. Interesting. So, uh, a key there is that you want to kind of keep your bet sizes consistent trade to trade. Is that is that correct? Your 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 bet size should be a fixed percentage of your equity. And that's because you, you don't know which which trade is going to be successful and which is going to be a loser. No, I know this, and this is an important part about money management. I know this for sure. The next trade that I'm in, despite all the money management formulas you read out there, and there's a lot of really fancy ones my good buddy Ralph Vance, Fred Gam, whoever's written them, they missed this one point. My next trade is 50-50. I'll lose on that trade or I'll make money on that trade. And that's the only trade that matters to me. It doesn't matter what the accuracy was in the past. So let's say I have 85% uh, accuracy in the past, which would tell me I can bet a huge amount of my money on the trade, but the next trade is 50, I'll win or lose. That's reality. So if I overbet based on it's been 85% correct in the past, it's really 50-50 on this trade though, I can get blown out. So you have to really factor that in. The, the next trade is all that matters. You know, I'm a gunslinger, the next gunfight, I'm gonna dead or I'm alive. It's a 50-50 deal. 
And it's the same way with your trades. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. And do you have a target risk to reward ratio that you shoot for? Like uh, you keep your your losses a certain fraction of, of your expected gains, or you don't really yeah, think about I'd, that? I'd like to, but it's. You know, I know you're supposed to have a three to one risk reward ratio, or whatever. Yeah. But in reality, sometimes it's five to one, sometimes a one to one. I like yeah. to keep it at least one to one. Um, because I think mo I'll have more winning trades than losing trades. So that's a basis. But, you know, I, if I can get a trade that's in a big move, I'll try to, you know, put my stops up because, as I said, the trend is time. So the more time I can be in a trade, maybe the more trend I can get. So I try to get as much time uh, trend as possible. Gotcha. And for, for those people who don't know, what what's kind of your average – um time frame and, and kind of how long you would hold a winner and also hold a loser losing trade my average time frame is probably 12 to 15 days mm -hmm. in commodities i did have a commodity trade one time it went over six months only one and that was in potatoes because i forgot i had it on my broker called me up Alan says hey what are you gonna do with these potatoes so in the old days when we had phones and brokers right and i said i don't know what do you mean so well you're long potatoes i had no idea i totally forgot that uh, that's the only long-term trade i think i've ever had in the commodity market perfect and uh larry i'd love to go through some charts with you and kind of talk through how you how you look at price action and interpret charts so uh yeah if you could if you could share your screen let, let's dive right in Whoa, let me see where we want to go. Let me bring up one. So what we're looking at here are two stocks. It could be stock commodities. It really doesn't matter. These happen to be two airline stocks, United Airlines and American Airlines. And so I, I'm looking at which market is stronger or weaker. Here's a good example. If we look at American Airlines made a higher high here than here, and United didn't. So if I'm negative on this market at this time, I want to sell this market because it didn't have as big a rally as uh, American Airlines did. My adage, if I'm going to get in a fight in a bar, I'm going to look for the skinniest, pinniest little guy. I can't. I don't want to fight the big guy. I want to fight the guy that I'm probably beat up. Same mm -hmm. thing in the market. Clearly, this stock was a lot stronger than this stock. Actually, we made new highs versus back here, and we didn't in Delta, uh, in sorry, United Airlines. So that's one I'd want to beat up and sell short. So when we start looking for a low in the market, though, oh, look what happens. We're making lower lows here, equal lows over here, and we're a little lower in American Airlines here and here. Mm -hmm. So then things start to change. So I'm really looking at, oh, look at this. Uh, United makes a higher high here. American Airlines doesn't. As we start to pull back, we have more of a base build up here than we do down here. So yeah, I think Amer United should pop up. Well, guess what? It did. So that's comparative strength um, uh, in a nutshell. I'm just looking for times when I have a family. So here we have airline stocks. They're highly related, correlated. Or it could be the metals. It could be the grains. Uh, it could be uh, interest rate futures. It could be stock index futures. So if there's a family there, then I'm going to look for this comparative strength to see uh, which market right now is held up the best. If I'm looking for a buy, which one has been the weakest? If I'm looking for a sell. Very interesting. And I, I just noticed how clean your charts are. You don't have any moving averages. You, <laughs> Yeah, you don't have anything like that. So it's it's really interesting to see, uh, yeah, how, how you've put this up. Um, and I did have a question. Um, do, you, do you consider volume at all on, on pullbacks and that type of thing? Because I noticed that's also not on your screen. Yeah, I... Early on, maybe in 1972, somewhere in that time period, I dedicated a year of my life, 12 months. I said I would only study volume for the next year. No, no price action, no moving averages through those away years ago. No, nothing but volume. At the end of the year, I looked through all my notes and found out I hadn't learned anything. I don't think that it's predictive. Now, mm -hmm. that flies in the face of what a lot of really smart people say. So I could be wrong. I'm often wrong, and maybe I wasn't smart enough to figure it out. But I don't use volume. I don't know that I, especially in stocks, and here's why. You may have a, a huge amount of volume in a stock because one fund swaps a, box, a stock, a big block, with another fund. It wasn't mm -hmm. real buying, real selling. Or especially now at the end of the year, 
uh, you're going to see a lot of tax movements coming into these markets. And that's not real buying, real selling. It's not really buying. It's, it's being arbitrage or there be a whole lot of reasons that have nothing to do with real accumulation distribution in the market. So maybe somebody else can figure it out and hopefully they do or have. I just haven't been able to do it. I, I you know, one of my many failures, I could not make volume work for me at least. Interesting. And as you're going through ideas, are you mostly looking at the, the daily time frame, or do you switch back and forth between different ones, weekly, monthly, and even intraday? So I don't look at intraday charts very often. I do for the S&P a little bit, uh, simply I'm just out of curiosity. The red line that you see is an indicator I developed a long time ago to help me forecast. So this forecast in advance what should happen. So when we're seeing that the forecast before we knew it, was the market start to rally, pull back, rally, start to come down, rally a little bit, rally in here, and start to come down. It gives me a general idea of what this market is going to do. It's an interesting tool. It's a, a little forecast tool I call cycle, re, cycle searcher, I think. And um, it seems to work for most all markets pretty well. It's not perfect. It's a combination of the three most recent dominant short-term cycles in the marketplace. As you can see, you know, given that this red line was known uh, about what, a, a couple of day, day and a half in advance, it has a pretty good record of telling us about what the market's going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll follow that. But other than that, no, I, I look at charts on a daily basis. Uh, yeah, where I'm in positions, I'm definitely a, a daily chart guy. I look at weekly charts for a setup in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. I want to see what the commitment of traders are doing. Let's see if I can go to that chart. So there I look on a weekly chart. I'm looking now at a weekly chart of cocoa market. I hardly ever trade, but I still follow it. So the blue line is my seasonal pattern. I see seasonally we should go down now. This red line shows what the commercials are doing. They've been buying on while well, the market's been declining. They've stepped into the buy side here. That's bullish. Seasonal pattern, yeah, I look at them there. The last thing I look at, because we often don't follow a seasonal pattern, then I see my commitment trader index actually shows that they have been buying in a significant fashion. They're buying back here. They're buying over here. They're buying here. It's on a weekly basis. I start, oh, we're getting set up. Here's my valuation model. We're also undervalued. So uh, every Saturday morning, uh, myself and my students all go to the market and say, okay, what market is set up to rally this coming week? So we'll have several of them. So that's a weekly basis. Then from the weekly basis, I go to a daily basis. Let's do that next. Perfect. So you're kind of combining timeframes and looking for the overall setup on the weekly and then going for the to the daily for execution. Correct. So we're now looking at a daily chart. This is a totally different market. This is cotton. I think, well, maybe there's a trade in cotton here. Uh, it's a very thin market. So notice I've got it I've ordered to buy five if it gets above a point in the marketplace. Well, why? Uh, well, look at the seasonal pattern. Just about now we start to go to the upside. The market's been in a strong trend and it's gone sideways for quite a while. Maybe it'll break out. If it does, I think if we get above the high of a day or so ago, I probably have a shot for a trade in there. And my potential target initially is here and my stop is down here and that's all set, click, it's done. So once I look at the weekly charts, I then go to the daily chart. So I go, this market has a tendency to go down. It should, there's a preponderance of evidence that it's set up to go up or down based on fundamentals. So that's my fundamental aspect on a weekly basis. Then I go to daily basis. Oh, uh, okay. The market's set up to be a buyer here. This is a nice big uptrend. The blue line is a seasonal pattern. It starts to turn to the upside now. And uh, mark, this market has been stronger than the other softs. So if it can get above a highest high the last couple of three days, that's worth buying. I don't notice that these are my actual orders. I have an order in to buy a five lot, um, but um, that's a very small position because this is a very thin market. I have targets set up in the market already, at least a preliminary target, and also a protective stop. So at this point, good night, I can go home, you know, I'm done. Uh, so that's really how I do it. I, I go for my weekly charts. So I have an idea of what markets are set up. Then I go to my daily charts, looking for a buy signal in the market or sell signal, depending yeah. on what the setup is. And how do you identify that pivotal point where you actually want to put in the order? You mentioned the high of the past three days, but here it looks like the, the alert is set through the high of the prior day. I drink a lot. That's, what, that's how you do it. 
I, sometimes I think maybe I should. Oh, you know, it's it's things like like this. Let me just use this chart as an example. You have, oops, wrong tool. You have a trend line coming down like this mm -hmm. in here. You have a seasonal pattern to go up. Uh, you've got a pullback on the market here. So there's a nice entry there in the market. The commercials have been buying this market in here. So really basic things. I wish I had better entry techniques. I'm looking for a formation of a higher short-term uh, low if I'm buying, lower short-term high if I'm selling, trend line breaks. And I have uh, uh, some mechanical tools, no better than anybody else's. I'm certain we'll put one on here. The, the entry helps me with my stop loss. I also have a mechanical trend following line that you see here. When we get below this line, the market should decline. When we get above it, it should start to rally. So right now we've actually fallen below it, which tells me a couple of things uh, that I can sell short at the lowest low or an oop signal or whatever in here, because I know where my protective stop is, is right here. If I bought back here, I know my protective stop trailing this up is, is in this area. I cannot let the market get much past that point. So it's a nice tab of trailing stop here. You see the entry is here, stop trails up and it exited over here. So I have an idea that if I do catch a big fish in here, I can write it for quite a ways. But you can do that for an individual stock. I don't know what stocks have been active here recently. Apple, I suppose. Again, I'm mm -hmm. not a stock guy. We're looking at Apple now. And again, you see the same formula. This is a nice trend following mechanism to hold us in a position, especially if we get long, we get a big trend move in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And this is really interesting. These gray lines that you see on the chart, I was doing this today. Um, these are buy signals that we gave in my 2021 stock market forecast. We said you should be a buyer on the 22nd day of February, a buyer on the 22nd of March, over here on about the 18th day of uh, May. All these were buy points known a year, given to people a year in advance. Pretty good buy areas, got buy points in the marketplace. There was another one wasn't so spectacular. I have one coming up in a little bit, not quite here yet. Mm -hmm. but, but a lot of stuff with the stock market, there was one also uh, a buy in the 18th of um, January. Those buy points were only a year in advance in the stock market. So mm -hmm. this is way out of sample, way out of, of what you should have known about the market. So for, for stocks, I think uh, they're actually a lot easier in some respects to trade because this is based on a seasonal pattern that I found in Apple. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll also find short-term setups in the market. A good example, uh, on Jim Cramer's Bad Money, uh, I don't know, four weeks ago, I said, do you want to buy uh, the second trading day, first or second trading day of November? We have a real strong seasonal rally to rally at that point. Well, look at the triple Qs, look at the minis, look at anything. The first three or four days of November, incredibly strong. How did I know that? Because that's what usually has happened. We have strong seasonal patterns. Now, some of these, what look like strong seasonal patterns aren't. So you have to be able to confirm those to know that this year they're going to really work. That's a whole nother subject matter. But so I can get a pretty good example. Like we want to be a buyer here. Want to be a buyer here. Want to be a buyer here. Want to be a buyer here all known a year in advance. So mm -hmm. I also look for these seasonal sweet spot trades in the market. Perfect. And we've covered now a little bit the, the entry setups and tactics and your initial stop loss. What actually um, tells you to exit a trade and, and what makes you sell? Uh, well, I, in theory, and this is just a theory, I think there are targets that we should go to in the market. Not Fibonacci numbers, but kind of like that, my version of it, okay? Actually, uh, I read a book uh, in the 1960s by uh, George Siemens, S-E-A-M-A-N-S. It really impressed me about where targets should be in the marketplace. So I can use his targets, a lot of Tom DeMarc's targets I'll use. So if the market really gets expanded and goes way up, I'm going to get out. I'm going to take my mm -hmm. profit. It might go higher, but I've got a nice profit. And uh, so if I don't get to a target, because I don't always, then I'm going to have a trailing stop and the, an initial protective stop loss, which I'll trail up if I start to get a nice win in the, in the market, in the trade.
Perfect. And one thing I really like asking people about is their their daily and weekly routines and how they kind of set themselves up for success when the, the markets are actually open. So I'd love to hear about your routines, your habits um, that you do pretty much every day and every weekend uh, to identify ideas and, and uh, basically prepare for, for the next week. My daily routine is pretty simple, really, uh, because uh, I don't do any day trading. So that makes it simple. Uh, my work begins when the markets close. After the markets close, I then look at every market, the ones that I'm trading, uh, the ones I think are set up, and I'll make notes. Uh, I have my notebook. I'm sorry to do that today. I don't know if you can see that or not, but I'll mm -hmm. start to write my notes on each market so I know what's set up for the next day. And that's, you know, you'll see page after page of that. Um, that's what, uh, what I'm looking for the next day. Mm -hmm. This is a really important book to have, to have a notebook. That way you can go back and you look at winning trades, losing trades, what I do right, what I do wrong. You're going to learn from all that. So this is important to me. Then I'll, I'll put my trades. I place my trades and I'm done. Um, I watch the markets a little bit during the day, the next day. But really, if, the more I watch it, the more I screw it up. It's yeah. been my learning lesson. So in my case, since I'm not a day trader, goodbye. I walk away, see what happens at the end of the close. And then the process begins over again until Saturday morning when I have my weekly charts and look at the seasonality, commitment trader report, valuation models, all the longer term fundamental setup. Then that gives me a guideline to focus my attention to on the daily charts this coming week. Perfect. And outside, outside of trading, what kind of helps you de-stress and, and focus your mind and, and get ready mentally and physically. I, I, I believe you're a marathoner. Is that correct? You do a lot of running? I, I was a marathoner. I yeah. ran about, I don't know, 70 some marathons, I think, an ultra marathon. I don't do that anymore. Uh, uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe the three knee operations. I still do 5K, still compete uh, in um, uh, my home state, Montana, as a Montana Big Sky State game. I compete there. I added, it was really fun. It's, I'm doing more sprints and 5K, but I added the high jump, which I've never done before. Hmm. It's a really technical sport. This makes commodity trading look easy. <laughs> it's really, boy, you've got to make the J curve, the right approach, a flip over the bar. Um, so uh, I, I want to live a long time because I like to trade. The longer I live, the more I can trade, right? Yeah. So I've really been into a healthy lifestyle um, because – uh, wealth is not health. Health is more important. For so sure. I really focus on you know, just staying in good shape. For sure. And do you see any parallels between trading and, and competitive sports? Do you, you think one helps you and the other? And uh, I'm sure it teaches you a lot about discipline and, and, and habits as well. Yeah, and, and sticking through pain. Uh, when right. I played football in college, I got hurt. When right. I rode rodeos, I got hurt, but you still had to get back on the horse. Uh, the bond trader I mentioned, Charlie DeFrancesca, the largest bond trader in the history of the world, a phenomenal guy, passed away, uh, was a football player in college. Most of the really good traders have an athletic or, strange enough, a musical background. Uh, but I think that an athletic background it, it kind of draws us to this because we're competitive. We want to yeah. want to beat, not beat the other guy. I want to beat the game. I want to beat the market. I, I don't want to hurt somebody else. I want to try to maximize my abilities, my skills at this particular game called trading. 100%. And I'd love to hear your kind of overall thoughts and advice for, for new traders out there who want to want to have a 60 year career trading like you've had. What tips do you have for longevity? What tips do you have for overall performance over that time? J just kind of anything general to, to help out a struggling trader? Well, let's start with health because that's the most important thing. Um, uh, I was really impressed by the Framingham study. That's the largest study ever done on the American population health study. And it said the number one predictor of how long you will live is lung function. Mm -hmm. uh, so the more powerful your lungs are, and you can do that through screaming, I guess, if you're a day trader or short term high intensity, that seems to be the best way called hits mm -hmm. or some call it uh, um pack eight or something like that, yeah. pace eight, uh, a real intense short-term blast of exercise will help your lung function. Obviously, you don't want to smoke anything. You want to do anything that's going to be bad for your lungs. That's the number one predictor of how healthy you're going to be. 
So anything, I used to think when I worked out, I played football, lift weights, I thought that was all that made me healthy. But it's really the lung function that's going to make you the healthiest. So that's the number one thing, obviously, watching your diet and not getting overweight. Um, so then, then switching into the markets, just know you're going to get beat up in this business. This is not an easy business. I, despite, I read all the instant paths to wealth on the internet, and I go, damn, that looks really easy. I wonder if I could do that. I go, wait a minute, this is trading. <laughs> this is what I do. You know, be really careful. Ronald Reagan said it best, trust but verify. You read all these internet claims, you may look into them, but don't buy it until you verified it. Um, this is a big up and down business and you better be emotionally prepared. And more importantly, if, if this isn't for you, the sooner you get out of it, the better it'll be for you. Not everybody's cut out to be a trader. Once you acknowledge that, you, you boy, you leave this behind, you're going to have a good, clean life again. So that's really important. It's like, you know what? This isn't cut out for me. Uh, get out of it. And if it is cut out for you, don't look for instant wealth. This is a, a ongoing educational experience. I've known traders who are still trading older than I am. And that was pretty much what they said, too. There's an old soybean trader who was trading when he was 86 years old. And he said, you know, I'm still learning this. He was a pit trader. He said, I'm still learning this. And so am I, and it, that's that's a, a kind of a nice thing that yeah, every day there's something to learn. This is uh, it keeps you awake, keeps you alive. And and you're always still going to make mistakes that you got to work through. And yeah. Oh yeah, and on mistakes. When I used to do live things, I'd ask a show of hands: How many people here have lost money not because of your market calls or judgment, but because of your trading platform? You didn't use it right, or you didn't understand it, but the trading platform lost. But all the hands go up in the room. So the trading platforms are dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll bet you've made mistakes with a trading platform, right? Yeah, for sure. For we sure. all have. So you better really know your trading platform and double check and double check and triple check your orders. You click, oh, it's too easy to do it. Um, I, I distinctly recall in the old days, I had a broker, Ed Walter. I called him up one time and said, um, sell, I don't know, sell 30 soybeans to the market. He said, you mean buy, don't you? I said, yeah, I said buy. He said, he said sell. He knew that I wanted to buy, right? Yeah. But it was an error. He caught it. There's nothing to catch your errors now, except you. On these, these trading platforms, you can be very, very careful of them. Perfect. And just, just one last question, Larry. What do you think has been the biggest changes to the market over the course of your career? Has it gotten a lot faster? Yeah, what kind of is different nowadays? Well, the big difference for me in commodities is going to electronic markets. Yeah. And uh, we don't have those pit sessions anymore. Starting about 2002, we went into electronic markets. So we open, we close. And part of that is, as we talked about earlier, thanks to the internet and electronic, the marvels of today, Everybody knows instantly the news in the marketplace, the news yeah. around the world. So the markets are much quicker. But time frames that worked in the past are not the time frames that work today, which mm -hmm. tells me again, I have to adapt to the markets. The markets don't care about Larry Williams. I have to care about them. I have to adapt. There'll be other changes. Uh, we talked earlier, my, my big trading markets were pork bellies and soybeans and all those things hardly exist anymore, right? I'm now trading things that didn't exist when I first started trading. You could, gold was illegal to own when I was a young guy. You, you couldn't own gold in America. It was illegal. You couldn't, you couldn't own it. Uh, and now I'm trading it and trading treasury bond. There were no treasury bond contracts. So I don't know what there'll be in 30 years about cryptocurrency, I guess. I don't know. But you, you have to stay alert uh, and awake as to the trend changes in the world, not just the markets. Perfect. And any less thoughts on kind of trading psychology and advice specifically about that? Because I think that's a that's a big part of trading as well. Well, this is not a business for perfectionists. Yeah. The perfectionists want to be right. You're not going to be right all the time. So, so it's really tough on perfectionists. Um, you have to just realize that there's, you're going to take your lumps in this business. And uh, that's the best part of psychology. You're really, some people say you're trading your own personality. Uh, I know this, uh, my son's a psychiatrist educated at Johns Hopkins, and Jason did an interesting study of just winning traders. All mm -hmm. the other literature before had been on losing traders. So I introduced Jason to some major winning traders in the world, names you'd all know. 
And he did a personality profile of these traders. And we learned several things from their personality profile that might help. One is they're all really good with details. That's my real weakness, by the way. They all had strength of weakness, but that was that was stood through them. Also, they were not very emotional people. Mm -hmm. um, you could walk right up to them and say, hey, your wife just left or whatever. They probably say, oh, okay, well, I have to go trade the markets now. They're, they're, their emotions don't flip flop back and forth. They don't. Right. And, and I think I'm pretty good with that because I've been trading so long. Uh, but they they don't get real emotional mm -hmm. about things. That's one of their strengths. That's the interesting one they learn is that we learn. They're not overly confident people. Uh, you would think these I mean, some of these people are multi billionaires. They'd be like, hey, 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 you know, buy, sell, whatever. They're not that way at all. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably why they're successful because you're not really overconfident. You never bet real big. Yeah. And so that's a, a it's interesting insight and in reflection after Jason's survey, I can think of a lot of traders I knew who blew up and they're all yelling, screaming, shouting, pounding the chest like how big of a guy I am. They all blew up. So you don't want to be real confident in this business. You want to be good with details in this business. You want to don't be overly emotional in this business. Those are the traits of really winning traders. Uh, people could read Jason's book, which is um, The Mental Edge in Trading by McGraw-Hill. Mm -hmm. Uh, if they want to learn more about that. So you're basically saying you can't, it's, it's tough to be a good trader when you've got a lot of ego, where where you've got that overconfidence, the cockiness. Yeah, because you'll bet too big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Larry, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think we've covered a really extensive amount of knowledge in this interview, and I want to really thank you for your time. Um, and I wanted to ask you, where's the best place for people to reach out to you or, or contact you if they have any questions and want to learn about your methodology? Please don't contact me. I'm trying to retire <laughs> and I'm failing miserably at it. Um, our website is irreallytrade.com. I don't do anything anymore publicly. I will do my annual forecast report at the end of this year, which has been really, really accurate. Uh, so we know a year in advance what stocks are going to do. But short of that, you can uh, go to our website and sign up uh, for our list or whatever. But I don't do anything else. So I don't want emails. I don't, I'm not a handholder anymore. I don't publish anything. So, you know, find somebody else to be your guru. Uh, I'm not. The only thing I do is trade myself and uh, our annual forecast report. Perfect. Uh, well, Larry, I want to thank you very much for taking the time out of your day and, and speak with me. I really enjoyed it and I, I learned a lot. I'm sure everybody watching did as well. Um, so, so thank you so much and to everybody watching, I hope you enjoyed. If you did go ahead and leave a like down below and subscribe to the Trailline channel and we'll see you guys in future videos. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.